could only go back in time I'd make my way to Euclid Beach Park Lying by the Lake Erie Shore A breezy wind through a sycamore I can see the flying turns now The thrill that it takes you high And over the falls Remembering them all Just like yesterday I can see those simple things again Popcorn balls and candy kisses I can still hear laughing sound And as a boy I wondered how Let's ride the racing coasters the Great American Racing Day If only they were here And not just lost in time Folks dropping by the old dancing hall Little ones head for the colonnade Here comes the sleepy hollow train I want to be there just once again So many days of summer Euclid Beach Park. For hundreds of thousands of Ohioans, these three simple words mean a lot. Rarely do you witness such a flood tide of emotion resulting from the mere mention of a place. Perhaps that is so because Euclid Beach Park was more than just a place. It was a time. A time when life seemed slower, less frenzied. A time when families had a place to call their home away from home. And a time when traditions were strong and less complex. For most, remembering Euclid Beach Park is a simple matter of closing one's eyes. With little effort, you remember the sycamore trees, the green benches so neatly arranged along the promenade, the squeals of children as they glided along the sleepy hollow. You remember the smells of popcorn mostly, but also the unmistakable scent of warm machine oil liberally applied to lubricate the thriller and the racing coaster. 
More than anything else, the memory of Euclid Beach Park is of pure fun. It was fun for the very young and the very old. It was fun for the first time visitor and for those who made it an annual pilgrimage. It was fun for couples who danced and for couples who watched. It was fun for a day, for a week, for a lifetime. I, every time I come down to State Park, I'll take my dog for a walk there. I see spots where it brings back memories to me. I can even hear them and see them actually in memories, the dancing and the music and the aerial dips and the places where this was and where that was. It, it, it's a sad thing. It's really sad to uh, see something leave that was such a good park like that and to uh, just have memories of it. So many of you people probably remember the Loganberry drinks and the hot dogs and how good they were and the popcorn and the candy kisses. It was great, it was great. And Laughing Sal, I laughed just to see the people laugh at Laughing Sal. <laughs> she, she was really funny. And some of the people, you, you could just get a, sit down on a bench there and just watch him and you, you've had an entertainment for yourself. It was really good, them days. The history of Euclid Beach Park is wrapped around a popcorn ball and the twists of fate that led Dudley S. Humphrey and his family to Ohio. What began as a simple idea, selling popcorn on a Cleveland street corner, grew into a successful family business and eventually led to ownership of Euclid Beach Park. Under the Humphreys' watchful eye, Euclid Beach Park was transformed from just another amusement park into a clean, vibrant, wholesome family park that became more American than hot dogs or mom's apple pie. From the outset, the Humphreys knew that making park visitors comfortable was the best form of advertising they could offer. This was more evident at the park campgrounds than anywhere else. In the early years, the campgrounds were heralded as clean, dry, and comfortable, if you liked sleeping in a tent. By 1915, the Humphreys added a series of concrete cottages that made a week's stay at the park not only possible, but downright enjoyable. From the beginning, the surf and sand of Lake Erie was realized as a natural draw to Euclid Beach Park. The beach played an integral role in the park's social development. Perhaps no better place existed to sit and watch people or have a long, relaxing conversation. When the beach became too crowded, the folks just ventured out onto the pier. The pier, a fixture at the beach since its inception, spent each winter fighting off the mighty power of Lake Erie. And while the lake tried to turn it into rubble, the pier hung on and was back in service each spring. One of the traits that separated the early years at the beach from the later was the popularity of the company picnic. Throngs of employees representing some of Ohio's largest companies would flock to the beach to be part of the fun and the camaraderie. The Humphreys catered to the employees, providing each with a fun, clean, wholesome place to spend a day with family and co-workers. It was at a company picnic that the idea for a kid's candy scramble was born. Simple in form, the results were never disappointing as kids scrambled to capture a piece or two of their favorite treat. The picnic area was designed with families in mind 
clean and well organized, it was a joy to use. Many a family reunion unfolded at the beach each year. The Humphreys realized early on that an amusement park without roller coasters was no amusement at all. Dating back to 1896, when the Switchback Railway made its debut, Euclid Beach Park was home to more than its fair share of coasters over the next 60 years. By 1904, the Switchback was dismantled and another coaster was constructed in its place, the Figure 8. The Figure 8 was just that, a Figure 8, and like its forerunner, it was a gravity ride coaster. In 1907, the Scenic Railways coaster was added. It was the first to use cables to draw coaster cars up the first hills and included brakemen who rode the coaster to control its speed. Later, the aero dips would occupy the space formerly reserved for the figure eight and thrive until 1965. In 1913, the racing coaster made its first run. What easily could have been billed as twice the fun of any ordinary coaster, the racing coaster featured two sets of cars racing on parallel tracks. This feature led to many a competitive race. Few ever knew park workers could and often did control the outcome of such races by choosing to use the built-in safety brakes. After all, that would have spoiled the fun. The coaster history of Euclid Beach Park would never be the same following the winter of 1923. During the off-season, plans were drawn up and construction was underway on the Thriller. Designed for speed, the Thriller's highest point measured an unheard of 71 feet 5 inches. The Thriller, advertised as safe but strenuous, certainly lived up to its billing. It packed a punch. For those who wrote it, Mere words cannot describe what happened to their stomachs somewhere between the top of the first dip and the bottom of the second. Invariably, though, your stomach did catch up with you.
By the late 1920s, the Humphreys had to be wondering what they would do next. How could they top the thriller? Never fear, for a new and even more popular ride was conceived, constructed, and unveiled just in time for the 1930 season. It was called the Flying Turns, and its popularity challenged the supremacy of the thriller as the park's most talked about amusement attraction. Unlike the coasters of that era, the Flying Turns had no track, just a bobsled-like chute that allowed the cars to blast down a rounded half-barrel shaped course in a seemingly uncontrolled and free-willing frolic. With two persons per car, it quickly grew into a favorite ride for young couples. turns was a fun ride to operate one of the highlights of course was the fact that you people were messy and you lost everything I'm saying hats glasses glass eyes false teeth hair pieces and uh, if you owned it you lost it and I might like to add at this point that I want to thank you because a lot of you lost an awful lot of money on Euclid Beach Parker's flying turns and uh, there were many days as a ride operator I made more money in the barrel, finding money in the barrel and in the car seats than I did in my paycheck. Well, one of the fun things about growing up in Euclid Beach Park as a, park em a child of a park employee, that we children had uh, these rides to play with. We played hide-and-go-seek and tag and various other things, uh, just like the average kid did. But we had the rides to do them on. Uh, my two sisters were the first to learn how to roller skate down the flying turns. Uh, I got blamed for it because the steel wheels on the outdoor skates in those days put a scratches in the barrel and Fred Greenway wasn't the least bit happy about it. But anyway, uh, after having gotten indoor skates, uh, we continued to roller skate down the flying turns. We learned how later to do bicycles, ice skates, wagons. It was great fun uh, being raised in, in Euclid Beach Park and it was even more fun working for the park. While speed, thrills, and chills were the drawing card for most amusement parks, no park could be complete without a gentler mix of rides and attractions for the more meek of heart. As with most things, the Humphreys understood this concept very well. In 1903, the legendary Flying Ponies was erected. What made the Flying Ponies so unique was its design. Unlike earlier carousels, the Flying Ponies featured carved wooden horses that were suspended from the top of the ride. The Flying Ponies were also allowed to swing outwardly as the ride made its circular path. It was this action that led to the name Flying Ponies. Without a doubt, the grandest of all Euclid Beach Park carousels was simply known as the Carousel. Built by the Philadelphia Toboggan Company, the Carousel was strategically placed at the hub of the park. This remarkable creation featured four rows of wooden horses that seemed to grow more lifelike with each rotation. Just one look at the details of the fantastic chariots and you knew the carousel was molded from the hands of true craftsmen. Just east of the carousel was the granddaddy of carousels, the Great American Racing Derby. Built by a California company, the Great American Racing Derby featured rows of four horses that moved not only up and down, but backward and forward as well. Each horse competed against the other as each raced for the finish line. The winning horse and rider both owned bragging rights for that day.
The Humphreys always had an abundant number of rides that catered to their slightly more tender patrons. There was the Colonnade, which housed the Kitty Land, a magical place where little people ruled the roost. Kitty Land was really a park within the park, since most of the rides imitated the park's larger rides. Just like in the grown-up park, there was Kitty Rocket Ships, miniature forms of the shiny, authentic version. Who can forget the helicopter ride, which let young aviators try their hands at being pilots? Young sailors were enthralled by the boat ride as their vessels took them around and around. There was the kiddie pony ride with majestic carved ponies that pulled kids around the circle. There were kitty autos with steering wheels that moved. The kitty whip was the junior copy of the larger ride that often served as the introduction to a lifetime of amusement park fun. The miniature bug was a small version of the adult ride. Youngsters mounted their wooden horse and instantly transformed into rootin' tootin' cowboys on this ride. The kitty carousel holds a special place in every young boy's heart. Outside Kittyland were more rides just for toddlers. No future fireman could possibly resist a turn on the Kitty Hook and Ladder. On the hand cars, you put your own muscle power to work cranking your car around the circular track. There was the pony ride, where real ponies pulled carts full of delighted children. There was the kitty over the falls that included a small hill and many plunge at the end.
future travelers always took a turn on the mini turnpike. Kids eagerly awaited a ride on the famous Sleepy Hollow train. As park visitors grew up, so did the rides. One ride that was either billed as a must-do or must-avoid was the bubble bounce. And while it had little to do with bubbles, it had everything to do with bounce. Later, the bubble bounce was replaced by the rotor, where watching was almost as much fun as riding. Over the Falls presented riders with a couple of unique opportunities. On hot summer days, you looked forward to the cool splash at the end of the ride. And on any day, you looked for the chance to steal a kiss before you emerged into daylight. While not technically a ride, the Surprise House was aptly named. Designed to distort your senses, the Surprise House rarely disappointed. 
slanted rooms, moving staircases, and of course, laughing Sal. Since they turned left when the driver turned right and went forward when he wanted to go backward, the Dodgem cars were always good for a laugh. The Rocco planes looked like a Ferris wheel but wasn't nearly as tame. The laugh in the dark was so very memorable, it took you all day to forget what you saw. Ghoulish figures greeted your arrival and pestered you throughout. over, you heaved a sigh of relief, paused for just a moment, and then ran back into the line for another go. People remember the laugh in the dark as the longest lasting ride in the park. If you wanted driving excitement, you could try the antique cars, which toured lazily through turn-of-the-century scenes. The turnpike cars were introduced at a time when America was traveling across country on new super highways and sports car type autos over a winding course.
The rocket ships, constructed of stainless steel, were like nothing else. Introduced during the Flash Gordon Buck Rogers era, the circular ride was an instant favorite. The flying scooters were introduced in 1938, and its greatest feature was the feeling of controlled flight as riders played a hand in how high they went. For a quick tour of the park, you could hop on the auto train. The bug was aptly named because of its unique rolls, twists, and turns. It was just like riding on top of a busy insect. The Tilt-A-Whirl was introduced in the 60s and represented a new generation of rides to gain popularity along with the Ferris wheel. Also in the 60s, the Scrambler replaced the Rocco planes.
When your stomach could take no more, you could choose to slow down the pace with a relaxing game of shuffleboard or miniature golf. Since going to the beach was usually an all-day affair, you always had a chance to try one or more of your favorite treats. Frozen Whip, Popcorn Balls, and the Humphreys Homemade Taffy were favorites. While Euclid Beach Park was certainly gone too soon, it's the memories that keep it alive. Euclid Beach Park's dance pavilion represents more of what was right about the park than any other attraction. A huge complex, the dance floor covered 18,000 square feet. The floor was an excellent uh, floor to dance on. Uh, the maintenance of that floor was uh, incredibly uh, taken care of by the, the uh, the ownership, uh, and I must my, might add, my brother had a lot to do with that too. He was also in charge of that dance floor, and had a lot to do with seeing to it that uh, the proper uh, chemicals were put on the floor. Uh, we had a combination of a, a dust and wax that was uh, that was maintained, and it was maintained every night uh, until the closing. As you know, it was a park plan. Park plan means 
that you pay for each dance and the floor is cleared. Now, the, there were ticket takers, we called them choppers, and there were eight, and on the weekends all eight were going full blast, uh, the other nights maybe two, four, six, depending upon the crowd. The night went something like this. You had to get there an hour before the music began, and you had to open the entire perimeter of the dance floor, downstairs and upstairs, were four-foot windows, the entire perimeter of the sides, okay? And that meant lifting the window up and hooking it up to the ceiling, and that, that opened the ballroom because the, the lake air, and you know, you could hear the music all over the park because it was wide open. And then uh, throwing the chicken feed, the, uh, the cornmeal and, uh, and the wax on the floor and then trying it out and sliding on it to be sure it was, uh, you know, the appropriate uh, smoothness and slickness for dancing. And then the people, as they came through the choppers, would go out and dance, pay their tickets, and then as the music was nearing the end, and then two men would come from the extremes of the sides of the front of the dance hall, and they were pulling retractable ropes. They would lock their arms and then walk down the middle, which formed this big V for all the people to exit. And as they broke those arms, the band started the next, the next tune. And then they'd have to come right back in, pay their two tickets, and go out again. Many a romance was launched on the pavilion dance floor as the warm summer breeze brushed the sycamores and a full moon glistened off the shimmering lake. It was just a wonderful meeting place. And uh, as I mentioned before, probably a third of all the people married in Cuyahoga County met their, met their spouse there. From the first note played by John Kirk and his orchestra in 1895, nine different band leaders controlled the baton at the dance pavilion. Vic Stewart took over the bandstand in 1945 and remained as orchestra leader until 1959. His tempos were danceable, and that's what he was known for is danceable music. And if you, if, if you understand that part of it, you can see why we had at least 100 to 150 regulars dancing at the park seven nights a week. Uh, I, I think the, the greatest tribute that, uh, that can be paid my dad as far as the music business is concerned is that he persevered, but he persevered for the people. He loved people. He wanted to make them happy. And when you came to a, a Vic Stewart orchestra night, you were going to enjoy good, danceable music. And to watch the people at intermission go in throngs right out the front door of the dance hall to the hot dog stand, to the popcorn stand, to all this, and, uh, and then be back there for that first dance 20 minutes later. Just a wonderful place. Can't say enough good about it. While most believe the dance pavilion was without rival, a strong argument can be made for the popularity of the roller rink. Constructed originally in 1904 and then expanded in 1909, the roller rink saw its fair share of yearly patrons as well. But it was the addition of the world-famous Gavioli organ in 1910 that preserved its rightful spot in amusement park history. For most, Sunday, September 28th, 1969, holds little significance. Many say the end was inevitable. The beach, after all, was just another victim of the 60s, and the 60s forever changed most of America. Still others argue that Euclid Beach Park would have, could have, should have survived the turbulent 60s. But in the end, the grand old lady was silent, calmly awaiting a fate she seemed to somehow understand.
ironically, what took 60 plus years to assemble came tumbling down. The screams of joy, the smell of fresh popcorn, the distant strain of a favorite melody were all muted by a disorder called progress.